So now, uh, Bill Hemis, or am I saying it right? Hemis, J E M A S. Jemis. Jemis. Uh, Bill Jemis. Bill Jemis. Uh, so uh, t tell us about working with Bill Jemis, because honestly, I, I kind of like uh, the stuff that he was kind of doing at the time. He was kind of a nutty guy. Um, how was working with him in comparison to Joe Casada as editor in chief in the late '90s? Well, again, you know, Bill, Bill, and there, there is no differentiation. Bill and Joe came in more or less together. Right. Bill was there. Bill was there first, um, and Bill had been there before. Like the the one, if I had any advantage at all during that time, it was that Bill had first worked for Marvel because he came in with Fleer. Bill was the person specifically who who. Uh, uh, took over trading cards and took them away from Budiansky and myself. Yes. So I had, I had history with Bill. Yes. Um, even before he, he came back. And, and so my, you know, my analysis of Bill is, is, is very personal and perhaps very slanted. And I try to be even handed about it. I really do. Um, <laughs> because, you know, the, the, the plain fact of the matter is Bill is a very smart, very sharp guy. He knows yeah. a lot about a lot. Um, and when he's in, in a good functioning mode, um, he was very good at cutting through a lot of the red tape and BS that built up around uh, uh, the field uh, and, and was very good uh, at saying why not in, in cases where something was an institutionalized belief or, or policy that you don't do this or you can't do that. Well, why not? We have to submit our stuff to the comics code or, or, you know, or we can't publish it. Well, why not? You know, and so he was he was excellent at that. Um, you know, he definitely had an interest in the comic book medium and the comic book field. Yes. Um, he he he. Yeah, and, and he's shown that even since leaving Marvel, where he's had a, a number of different ventures that have been comics related. There's something about this process and this field that speaks to him. Um, and and he could be sometimes like, a, you know, a generous and reasonable cat. But he was a fucking monster, um, <laughs> and a and a, and and a bully, and a tyrant, and mercurial, and 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 uh, you know he created a work environment that was as bad as I can imagine it being. You know, we wow. talked at the at the outset of this. At least for me, you know, uh, other people may feel differently. You know, certainly other people got along with him better or worse. I don't want to speak for. You know, a right, Joe Quesada everybody, but or you're an Axel Alonso right, or exactly. any, anybody else who might have been up there, Bobby Chase. Um, I can only I can only speak for myself. Um, you know, uh, 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 you know, we 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 spoke a while back about the Jim Shooter era. Yeah, and 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 I don't know what that was like. I didn't experience it. I wasn't there. Um, but you know, the closest I can I can parallel it to was when those couple of years when Bill was running Marvel. There was an analogy that, that, that Joe used and I will credit it to him, although I don't want to cast, you know, I'm saying this. So, so yeah. take this as coming from me that, you know, what Bill was really good at is if you had like a classic car and if you think of Marvel as like a classic car that, you know, it's, it's, it's been on the road for a while, it's kind of worn down and he's going to refurbish it. He's going to, going to restore it and polish it up and, put it back and make it shine again. Bill was great at doing that and he did it, but then he wouldn't stop and he kept polishing and he polished and he polished and he polished his way through the hood and polished his way down into the engine and started to polish all the bits off of the engine until what was left was a, was a wreck. Like he couldn't stop at a certain <laughs> point. There was a point where you just don't need to be pushing in that same way. And, and Bill was constantly pushing in that same way. Right. Um, so he it's like it's like a proctology appointment gone wrong. <laughs> uh, I, I'll 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 leave that part to your imagination, but <laughs> you know. Okay, so it, so do, do, what, what, when you say he was a monster, because um, I have one more question after the the monster part yeah. is, it, and then Jim's gonna take over on on the two thousands is is give me one example of your interaction with him that was monstrous. Um. I'll give you one. It's not directly mine, although I was a part of it. Um, one of Bill's theories at a certain point was that comic book covers should be more like magazine covers. Okay. <clears throat> and this started out, you know, one of the things that would happen with Bill is what I tend to think of as sort of like mission drift. 
when he started out, what he was reacting to is we'd done a lot of covers that were like fight covers. Here's the Avengers fighting the Lethal Legion, and there's 70 figures, and they're all tiny, and they're all fighting. And Bill liked very simple, straightforward covers. You can kind of see this if you look at all the early uh, Ultimate Universe covers. They're all just, here's Spider-Man. Yeah. <clears throat> here's Spider-Man. Spider-Man's on the package. That w- That's what you're getting. So he wanted there, there to just be single-figure covers. Past a certain point, though, he, he got more attracted to the, the notion of bad girl comics. And so that mission tended to drift towards, we want them to all be single-character covers, and they should be you know, effectively a porn act- actress bending over a Maserati. Right, I remember that. I remember those covers very well, very clearly you, too. Yes. If you if you look at any cover to Marvel past the first one, ah. that's that's kind of you know what he was what he was aiming for. Yeah, that um, was his manifesto, right, Marvel? It, it it I don't know if it was a manifesto. It started off as a as a gag challenge that kind of grew into something else as it went. Yeah. Um, it's it's sort of a fascinating study. Uh, I don't know if it's a great comic, but it's it's a fascinating. Uh, sort of character study if you can dig through it all. But yeah. anyway, um, this was the this was the thing. And in fact, there was a meeting at which Bill was unhappy with the covers, and he brought in a stack of comics, um, and he uh, proceeded to like throw them at people across the table because he this is this is shit. This is awful. This is crap. And there was a, a new assistant editor, and I don't want to mention her her name because why drag her into this after all this time um you know who had who had had started not that long ago was very intelligent was very promising went on to be uh a significant young uh ya author (coughs) and she had a comic thrown at her and it wanged off of her head and she left and she left the meeting and she went to the hr department and went i am i am done i quit i'm out of here yeah uh, and then the HR department was like, this is a lawsuit waiting to happen. Bill, we need you to go and, and fix this. We need you to, to apologize to this woman and make sure this doesn't become a problem. And Bill apparently called her to his office to talk to her. And his opening line was reportedly, and I, I say reportedly, but I heard this from her, so I feel fairly confident in it. Don't be a dick. No, that's horrible. Um, and that was just that that just sort of sums up the kind of, uh, you know, uh, it was almost like a fratish persona. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Did she, but, did she leave an, after that or did she oh, stay? Oh, yeah, she left. She, she yeah. was gone. <clears throat> um, you know, it was sort of an Ivy League fratish persona. Yeah, Bill was, Bill was very he, he'd also come out of the NBA. So he was very basketball focused, which was which was weird. He'd always want to like take people out and, and, and play basketball with them and show you how great he was, even though, you know, I, I'm hardly a basketball player, but he's, he was a middling player at best. Um, <laughs> I see. <laughs> but he wanted to, you know, like that was a part of his persona. Um, okay. and, and like Bill was always very effective in any room where he was the biggest guy. You know, again, when we, when we talked, when we talked about Tom DeFalco earlier, Tom was intimidating and didn't really realize he was intimidating because as much as anything, it was the position that made him intimidating. Bill could only function in a position where he had that authority in mm. a, in a fair fight. That's a guy that would have been beaten up a hell of a lot yeah, by, 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 by people because he was just such a prick in the way he interacted with human beings. And the only thing that, that kept him out of it was he was absolutely rock smart um and he was very savvy and and he had connections and he knew how to how to make things happen like i don't i don't want to uncredit him he was phenomenally instrumental um along with joe without joe none of it would have would have worked because joe creatively had the had the vision and had the insight that made that go and so whenever bill would have a crazy idea like oh we should we should restart spider-man it was joe who would go hey we should get this guy brian bendis to write it there and that was that was the piece that was almost more important than that initial idea. Yeah. Like that, you know, Joe was the one that actually, I think, 
enabled all of that stuff to function. But it wasn't just Joe. It was Bill pushing against all of this stuff. Uh, and, and without him there, I don't know that you could have turned around that business in the way yeah. that so it happened. Bill and Joe Quesada together turned Marvel around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and it's, it's proportional. Uh, and like I say, I, 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 I try to be as even-handed with this as I can because there's personal feeling and there's professional feeling. Yeah. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, even personally, like I don't, I don't have any particular ill will towards Bill. He's, he's working on the, the new venture AWA right now. I'm following a bunch of those books that, that Axel is working on over there. And that's a very nice line and I hope he's successful with it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I don't actually wish him any ill will. Um, I don't necessarily want to hang out with him. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I don't want to necessarily. So no, no ill will, no ill bill. You, you, yeah, uh, yeah, um, and and uh, you know the 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 persona he would put on for the public, where he would do these weird wrestling style interviews and things, he would be like that internally sometimes too, and that's when things were the craziest. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's the double-edged sword with the uh, shooter. Is I think financially he did turn Marvel around uh, in the in the early in like 1980 or so, but then creatively, there's a lot of crazy interpersonal things and and it's so it sounds like it's similar like what you said yeah uh, yeah and, and again i you know going back to jim you know obviously i said some things earlier that can maybe be taken as unkind but i wasn't there for i can only report on what marvel was like after on, him on, on what the other people said yeah and 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 uh you know there's there's no denying the fact that jim did a lot of good in terms of getting creators incentives in terms of building you know reprint structures Hell, putting the editorial staff that, that, you know, structure that we still use today into place, you know, and, and, and teaching a lot of people fundamentals about storytelling. I think Jim sometimes gets a little dogmatic about certain aspects of that, but that doesn't change the fact that a lot of that lesson was, was good and necessary. And while, uh, uh, you know, when I think of the Jim Shooter era as a, as a reader, I feel like it became a less interesting time. Uh, what I think he did was, you know, there, in, in, any, at any given point, there's a, there's, you know, the best comic you're putting out and the worst comic you're putting out. And that field is, is the distance. Everything else is between them. And so Jim maybe took the top, the best comic down a little bit, but he raised the bottom comic up a lot. And so the whole of the line was a better line pound for pound than it was in the more wild west days where you'd occasionally get this you know weird miraculous jewel that you know steve gerber or somebody did but alongside something that was just you know the worst kind of of we're, we're banging out 17 pages because we have a job to fill yeah. uh, you know kind of stories he was very good at equalizing the line and bringing up the level of craft um all across the marvel titles mm -hmm. um 